right, in the interest of time, we'll just get going here. So, real quick introduction to Mike Schrader, Miller Carlson, and Power Group. You know, we got about 30, 40 minutes here, which is certainly not enough time to cover this whole topic. So, some of it's going to be pretty high level, and some of it's going to be a little bit building off what you heard out there. But I'd say before we even jump in here, um, I think these sessions are way more fun and way more impactful if you guys have questions, ask them throughout. Shower them up, raise your hand, let's address the questions, let's address what you guys want to hear versus us rambling up here, so don't be shy. But the topic today is, you know, key insights, key drivers, what drives business value, what attracts premium offers, so that's where we're going to spend our time. And I kind of summarize it in the three buckets, so a lot of the stuff we kind of talk about in this session, I think, falls into one of these buckets, but I call it the first bucket is generally less risk, more certainty, drives value. The second bucket, I call it kind of turnkey. You know, what is the buyer getting? When he buys this, is it essentially set up and ready to go? Is the infrastructure in place? Is the people in place? Are the assets in place? And I think what, actually it's kind of not showing up on here. It's had a bell curve of sorts, so it's kind of odd that it's... It's a very light blue. But it is a normal distribution with the uh, center point between the average and the above average. So businesses are just inherently very complicated assets. When people say, hey, what's my business worth? It's kind of like, well, it depends. Can I ask you 20 questions about your business? Because you're asking about a multiple, and let's say, your business does 5 million EBITDA, your business does 5 million EBITDA. I might put a 10 multiple on your business and a 4 multiple on your business. So I kind that of sounded very it. nice, Mike. <laughs> well, you know, your business has a lot of risk. But anywho, I'd say the third bucket I didn't cover that drives kind of more of those premium values, which you heard out there from Paul Stewart, is really what are those growth opportunities? It's great that you're a five million dollar EBITDA business today, but is there a path, a logical path, to maybe get this to 10 million, 12, 15, 20 million? And when you kind of pull all three of those buckets together, you really shift on this value scale for kind of being a an average okay business to more of that high quality, high sought after business. So what we're going to focus on today, there's different buckets of what drives value. A really important bucket, which is off to the far right that we're not going to cover today, is different buyer types, different structures. So um, probably pretty obvious, the people that should be able to pay the most, and it's not always the case, but generally a very strategic buyer or a more aggressive PE firm to be paying more than an individual, a management team, or an ESOP like buyer. If we have time, and we did hear some of this out there, we put it at the tail end of our presentation, is market conditions. Certainly market conditions can be a driver. Um, I still think, I think we still think it's a very good market. Maybe you don't get five to seven kind of knock your sock off type offers, but when we go through a process, we're still getting one, two, three really, really attractive offers regardless of where interest rates are. Where we want to spend most of our time today is on, you know, what makes the financial profile attractive? What are those business characteristics, whether they're tangible or intangible, you know, that really stand out. And on the bottom here is just kind of a variety of different examples. And really the theme of this is focus on the things that you can control. There's a number of things that have an impact on value that are just out of your control. Macroeconomic conditions, somewhat what your competitors are up to. Historic financials are really important, but seven years ago, we can't just always focus on the past. So what are you doing to set up your business to be more turnkey, less risk, drive those growth opportunities? So we'll cover a lot of these individual things in the next few slides. So as we get into kind of the five areas of focus for the discussion, I think kind of taking some of the commentary that Paul Stewart had from PS Capital will be helpful for the conversation here. And I think what he brought up towards the end was try and take yourself and put yourself in the buyer's shoes and kind of view your business in the lens of a buyer and how they see it. Because ultimately they're going to be the ones purchasing you and they're going to look at all the positives and negatives to come up with you know, what they believe to be an appropriate price. So I think as we kind of go through the conversation here today, it's really important to keep that in mind 
is try and think like a buyer would. So the five areas of focus that we'll talk through, we'll go through the financials and the performance, which is a fairly obvious one. Usually businesses are purchased because you want to make some money. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. There's the people component to the infrastructure, which was also mentioned as uh, you know, a key component to valuing businesses, that would be the management team. Uh, the third one we'll touch on is kind of the positioning of your company relative to the market and your peers. The fourth one will be the potential and kind of the growth. As we heard Paul talk about, really they're buying businesses to scale it up. So thinking about what is that potential and how do you grow it is going to be critical in driving value. And then the last one will be identifying some problems and bringing those to the forefront to get those out of the way and making sure that everyone kind of understands um, you know, what things are potential issues. So with that, we'll get into performance. So one of the things that I always like to think about is risk versus reward. So as you think about the financials and the potential risks or uncertainty, those are going to drive, if you have more risk and more uncertainty, typically you're going to have a lower value. So when you look at the financial performance of your business, as kind of Mike described earlier, it is in the past. But the story of how you got to where you are is important. So for example, if you have a business that is very cyclical and has big ups and downs uh, for swings in revenue and also profitability, that can have a big impact on the value of your business. Because again, if you look at it from a buyer's perspective, are they buying it in a trough or at the top? You know, that uncertainty adds to uh, the difficulty in kind of valuing the business. A lot of investors, when they look at businesses and financials, would much rather see kind of a slow, steady growth as you kind of build the company over time, you're reinvesting, and you kind of see in incremental increases in profitability. So there are certainly cases where the story makes sense, that you have these ups and downs, but generally speaking, a business that's a little bit more consistent from a growth standpoint is gonna be valued uh, higher. Just again, because from a buyer's perspective, they wanna reduce risk and uncertainty. Um, the other thing that I mentioned was just with the profitability and the, the, the margins. I think, as we all know, we wanna see uh, margins increasing year over year. And I think there are some things that are embedded in that, which could be, are you investing in automation? Um, are you looking to improve efficiencies within your process? And those generally are gonna show up within the financial performance of the company. And thus, if you are showing a steady increase in those kind of uh, key metrics, that can also help to drive value and reduce the uncertainty of the business. So those are a few of the things that I just wanted to mention related to financials. I don't know, Mike, if you wanted to touch on any other ones, but those were some of the major ones. No, in the interest of time, we'll cover some of this later, but you know, years ahead of a sale, take a deep look at your financials, especially if you're just doing company prepared financials and compiled financials. I get it, a review, an audit, it costs money, but getting that financial house in order prior to a sale, you'll get a return on that investment. It's okay that you run personal expenses through the business, but really start cleaning some of that up. It's fine if you continue to run it through it, but make it easily identifiable for a buyer. The last thing they want to do is be digging through trial balances, asking questions, going through credit card statements. So, you know, just put some effort, put some money into the financials, you'll get a return on that. Yeah, yeah and I think that's a perfect segue to the financial portion of the equation here. And you know, one of the things that we see in the M and A industry in the lower middle market is, you know, businesses when you sell them and you go through the purchase agreement, you're really trying to assess what are the gap financials of this business, what are the accrual basis of this business, not typically the cash basis, 
all the purchase agreements are usually set up such that your rep, reps and warranties are two gap. So one of the struggles that we have a lot with companies that maybe don't have as sophisticated of accounting systems or are not following gap is it can be difficult to get them to gap and understand where the true performance of the business is. So one thing as a, a business owner or someone that's in the business that you can do ahead of time is really working with your accountant to get either reviewed. I don't necessarily think audited statements are always um, necessary. It's, I think, very uh, situational dependent if your bank needs them. But making sure that you have the proper accruals and that you're following GAP is very essential. I'd say one thing more recently that's come up is this ASC 842. And I'm not going to pretend to know that or pretend to be an accountant here, so don't quiz me on what, <laughs> what the standard is here. But essentially, it's a new accounting practice in regards to operating leases and capitalizing them on the balance sheet and then pro properly amortizing them over the course of the lease. And these are things that come up and more recently at deals, and if you can kind of prepare for those, you'll be much better prepared to, to sell and also to give buyers the confidence that you really understand your financial statements. Um, other things as far as financials that I would want to mention, you know, Dave Waggy had said, you know, one of the biggest surprises for him was really kind of the networking capital component of the transaction. And, you know, I think this is a key area that a lot of business owners don't totally understand when getting into a transaction. Um, what typically happens in a transaction is you set a target based on the last 12 months for your networking capital. And this would be your current assets minus your current liabilities. Um, now, for your target, you want to have that target as low as possible. So doing things like after you start the process doesn't really help you all that much in setting that target because it looks over the last 12, 12 months. So I'd say for your business owners that are looking to sell maybe in the future, looking specifically at how you can reduce your working capital in a appropriate way can be a very um, uh, significant portion to you as far as excess cash because you're really kind of taking some of that cash that you just have sitting on the balance sheet and extracting it. So that is one area to kind of keep in mind as you uh, look forward to selling your businesses, really looking at that networking capital component. Okay, the next area that I wanted to touch on was the people. So this is probably one of the biggest areas of due diligence that a buyer is going to go through and it is super important when doing a deal is to understand you know who are the key players within the transaction and the management team on every single deal regardless if it's going to be purchased by private equity or it's going to be purchased by a corporation everyone wants to know what does the management team have as far as capabilities how can they lead how can they grow? How do they deal with adversity, et cetera? So I think having a very well-rounded team is gonna drive the most value. That's not saying that if you don't have uh, a key management team already in place that you can't sell your business or find a buyer for your business, but the ones that ultimately sell for a premium price typically have a very robust management team put together. So one of the things that you could do as a business owner, as you kind of uh, look at your business if you don't have a key management in place, is kind of assess where your gaps are and come up with a plan to kind of fill those gaps over the next few years as you get ready for, to sell. Ultimately, we would love it if you worked yourself out of a job and we could just add back your entire salary as an adjustment to EBITDA. So essentially, you know, you're kind of creating this management team while still taking a salary and getting your compensation. But then when we go through the process, because you've worked yourself out of a job, 
you know, you're, you're really not necessary to continue with the business. So we can essentially add back your expenses related to your compensation to EBITDA, thus improving profitability. So that's one area that I would certainly recommend you kind of look at as you prepare to sell is, you know, who, who, who's on your uh, management team? How can you build that out? And how can you really work yourself out of a job? Now, that might not be possible in all cases, but we're kind of talking uh, theoretical in an ideal stage here. I mean, it's definitely tricky. If you've been running the business for 10 years, 40 years, 50 years, whatever it might be, you have a lot of travel knowledge in your head. The last thing we want as your advisor is for a buyer to walk out of that meeting and say, your child is a business owner. That is the most impressive individual I've ever met. How do I ever replace them? So when we go through these management presentations, what we call it, we bring the buyers here to meet the teams. We really try to limit Tyler's exposure there. Try to take that back seat. We know you have a lot of years of knowledge, but let your team shine here, because that's where the value is going to be created. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I would say, you know, we've seen a lot of value in working with attorneys on the front end of a process. And what I mean by that is for your man for your key management team, putting in place stay put bonuses. I think has been really critical to the success of some of our deals. And what a stay put bonus really is, is you know, for your key management team, you're kind of signaling to them that, hey, you're an important part of this company. I want you to be here, help me through this transaction, and then I'm gonna reward you, and I want you to continue to grow and prosper after the transaction. So a lot of times we'll recommend to our clients to put in these uh, key, key person uh, agreements with their key management team so that there's a significant, a meaningful amount of money that's kind of tied to the deal getting closed. Maybe say half of the compensation is getting too close and at close the person gets half of it. And then maybe a year down the road if they stay and maybe there's some other um, KPIs that they're measured against, but then the other half is released at that point. And we find this as a great way to really align everyone's incentives to kind of charge forward towards closing a deal. Because if you think about it, you know, if you're 100% owner of the business, you know, typically when you sell, you're getting all the proceeds, right? So there's a huge financial return for you as the owner there. But a lot of your key management team puts in a lot of extra hours on top of their uh, normal day job to help you out. So compensating them as well really helps kind of bring the transaction together. Here's a question on that. Yeah. So you're talking about <clears throat> incentives that have maybe uh, triggering points for some payout pre, you know, pre-transaction, and then some that might have a payout, you know, after the transaction is taking place. In your experience, how does that work when you've got, you know, the, the person that put the agreement in place, you know, has sold the business now; they're no longer part of the business but there's still like, you know, performance expectations in that kind of post-transaction period. Does yeah. the buyer kind of like kick in part of that typically, or is it, you know, how does that typically get structured? Yep, yeah, so what you really want to do is you don't want to have anything triggered until the actual close date. Sure. So nothing, in our opinion, you should do a pre-close because there's a lot of uncertainty until you get to that point. So what we'll see is like half of the payment is released at close. But what will happen from a mechanic standpoint is at close, the owner will actually either put the money into escrow or they'll actually true up the networking capital and give additional dollars to the buyer such that the buyer can pay uh, upon, say, a year of uh, being involved in the business. And that way, you know, if you think about it, there are some like taxes and other things that you have to consider. And if you're an owner and you don't own your corporation anymore, it can be difficult to then pay your people. So a lot of times you'll actually see just, uh, you know, a markup on the networking capital and that money just goes to the buyer. Now if the person leaves, then there's mechanisms to get the money back. Okay, so, thanks. Yep. Okay, the other thing that we'll touch on here is kind of infrastructure, I think, you know, one of the things from a buyer's perspective that's been kind of eye-opening over the last decade that I've been in the business is really the scrutiny on the kind of sales and profitability by products 
and customers, and if, what that really gets down to is making sure that you have the appropriate infrastructure and systems in place to gather that data. Every buyer nowadays is asking those questions um, way before due diligence is kind of, you know, what are you making on this particular product? Uh, how much margin are you making with each particular customer? And so having those accounting software, ERP systems in place are going to add a lot of value to your company. So if that's something that you haven't done yet, I would certainly encourage you to start looking at solutions that can help you get to that point where you can pinpoint on a particular job even, you know, did I make money on this job or did I not? And I will say as an investment banker, we love data. We just love it. So the more data, the better for us. So when we get a report, a million rows, that's like Christmas morning for us. We're like so excited to run our pivot tables and do some analysis. So don't think that too much data is a bad thing in this, in this realm. Too much data is not, not a thing. <laughs> but that data, just real quick to build off that, I was going to say this for a later slide, but things you can do one to five years prior to a sale to build value is really understand where you make money, where you don't make money, because those are some of the more easy levers to potentially pull. Hey, when I actually dove into the job costing data, I thought we were making 20% contribution margin on this. Dive into the data, we're making 5%. All right, something needs to change. You know? So understanding your data, understanding where you make money, is one of the biggest areas where you can drive value. I'm done talking for a little while. Well, I usually keep it pretty high level, so you yeah. might be back. Huh? All right, all right. All right. Um, the third kind of bucket we have here is position. So if you're a successful business, whether you've been in business for five years or 40 years, you're doing something special. So the more you can understand kind of what, whatever you want to call it, your secret sauce, whatever it might be, and build upon that is really important. Equally important then is articulating that to potential buyers. You know, why do customers buy from you? Obviously, it's probably some reputation, long-standing relationship, but there's probably other dynamics too. Maybe you're a single source supplier, maybe you're vertically integrated, you take the project from engineering and prototyping all the way through production, supply chain, inventory management. So really understand kind of what that special sauce is, build upon it, articulate it to that potential buyer. <coughs> understand where you kind of rank in Comparison to your competition, you know, so why do you get business? The industry grows at 2 to 4% annually, and you've been growing at 7 8%. All right, buyers are going to want to understand that. And maybe it's your lead times are 4 to 6 weeks, where your competition is 10 12 weeks. So, again, build upon your strengths, but also be able to articulate why people use you. I mean, that's usually the first question we get from potential buyers. I get it's a manufacturing business, but I'm not really clear what they do. But more importantly, I want to understand why they grow and why their customers buy from them. That's really what buyers are looking to understand. And the last thing here, you know, IP, whether it's a patent or a proprietary process, certainly can drive a lot of value. Um, it can also be a prohibitor, which I'll give two different examples. And sometimes a proprietary process is quite simple, but you figured out how to do something. You sold a business probably five, six years ago. Generally a very simple process. I mean, the asset investment was around 50, 60,000, but nobody else could figure out how to do this. So we went through this whole process, upselling the proprietary process, never allowed the buyer to see the process up until a week before close, and only the CEO of the buyer had to walk through and see that process, because it was essentially an at-risk component that made it all the costs to get into that line of business. So that was a positive on that deal. Maybe Tyler can correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but proprietary software um, allowed this individual, this business owner, to run his business really well. It's kind of a retail distribution business, but it's actually one of the biggest risk dynamics of the whole deal because buyers just couldn't get comfortable. What happens if that individual leaves, the software goes down? Do we have a business at the end of the day? Is that a fair summary of that situation? Yep. <coughs> Double-edged sword at times, usually a positive, but can be a negative. The other thing I would say on positioning that I don't know if I find it surprising or not, but when we talk to business owners, a lot of them don't tend to know what the application of the products that they're um, manufacturing go into. And one of the big things that you know private equity groups or buyers want to know is like, what are the trends that are driving the performance of sales? 
like why are you selling more of widget A than widget B? And so I think one thing that you can do as business owners, and sometimes you can't do it because there's you know confidentiality concerns, but like from your customer's perspective, understanding you know what is the product that that you're making for them going into. Now you might be one or two, you know, uh, a tier two or tier three, but like you know, does that go into a skid gear? Okay, well, what does what's driving kind of the additional sales? I think really kind of understanding that really adds a lot of value in selling your company if you can articulate that well, because you can kind of show that, hey, these are the trends that we see, and this is what's really driving the performance of the business. And buyers can get very comfortable very quickly if they can see some of that information. So I would encourage you to just be inquisitive as much as possible without being annoying to your customers. <laughs> Um, certainly you can cross a line there, but I think learning more about, you know, how their products are working in the market and what's driving their performance is critical. All right, the fourth bucket up here we call potential, but it's kind of building off the things we've talked about earlier, growth. You know, what can we do with this business going forward? You heard Paul Stewart and the others out there talk about it. Growth can come from a number of different things. There's some obvious things, it's not just, hey, hire more salespeople or buy this asset or do an expansion. It's really then telling that buyer, here's the roadmap to really make that happen. You know, here's the time investment, here's the cost, here's why I think I have traction if we make this investment. So we want more than a head nod for potential buyers. Yep, I get it. All right, help me understand what this could actually mean. Can I take this $5 million EBITDA business to $10 million in the next five years? Is that realistically possible? So. Income from a number of different aspects. And, you know, acquisitions very well could be that roadmap. I'd say to really get value from MA as a growth strategy, as a seller, it's identifying who really is a realistic target, but probably even more importantly, do you have warm leads? Do you have relationships with those folks? So, again, a buyer's got a head nod. Yes, MA is a growth strategy. I get that. But do you have warm leads? Oh, you actually know this company out west, that individual wants to sell in the next two years. Building out that pipeline will drive value for your business. So that's an important growth potential for your business. I'm here, we do have synergies. Synergies can come in a variety of different forms. I mean, cost synergies are real. Sometimes it's a less exciting one to talk about, but there could be some costs that are overlapping. So can we remove some costs, can we consolidate? The more exciting ones to talk about are, hey, are there cross-selling opportunities there? I do this, you do that, and together we can really grow this OEM relationship. Or there's always kind of the, the lesser known of a reverse synergy. Maybe you have a unique kind of purchasing power in the market that others don't. And if you can give that to the potential buyer, there's value there that can be created. So again, potential is really about building that excitement, building that roadmap for them to see that growth pattern. And ideally, if you put the time into building that into a projection, which we get, the projection's going to be wrong a couple days after it's produced. Always. Always. <laughs> And rarely do you probably meet or outperform kind of one of these high, high growth projections, but it's important. Buyers actually want to see it on paper to say, all right, that helps me understand that I think there's an opportunity here to really grow this business. So there is a value to putting all these ideas on paper and trying to articulate it financially. I know I kind of joked about the, the projections, but I think this is a really critical part of selling your business. Because someone's not buying your business for the performance that it had. They're buying it for what they can turn it into or what it can be. So I think for business owners, if you're not putting together a budget, a projection, or a five-year forecast, getting in the habit of doing that with your team is going to pay off down the road. So for those of you that don't, it's not necessarily... It's not critical or uh, necessary to sell a business to do that because we would certainly help you. But I think when a buyer sees the thought that you've put into your projections and your budget and can see, you know, this isn't just a back of a napkin type calculation, that goes a long way. So I would certainly encourage um, many of you who are not probably doing that to, to look at that as a goal for this year. Yeah. On the buyer side, like how much stock do you put in a company's projection they give you versus their historical results? Because I mean, you've talked before about you know, you could slap a different level of EBITDA on the trailing 12 months 
but you know, obviously put a projection out there. Do, do they really factor that in much when they do, you know, kind of value the business? Um, probably depends on the circumstances. Y yes and no. So a lot of times the businesses are going to be valued based on the trailing 12 months. What we'll try and do is we'll actually try and sell the company on the forward looking earnings or the projection for that year. So that could be one factor is, uh, you know, you're getting a value based on what you're going to do. But I think one of the nuances to it is if your projections, but I mean, certainly a hockey stick or whatever they may look like, if you can support those in a very articulate way, you're going to have more interested buyers. And when you have more interested buyers, you have more leverage, which then means you get better price, you pay best, better terms. So it's kind of a cycle that it goes into. It's not just, you know, you put together these projections and you get a better price, but like if they're fully vetted and supported, I think that does lead to a better outcome. That makes sense. Oh, Mike, do you have anything to add? Well, I think it just gives them confidence to maybe stretch a little bit harder on that deal. Are they going to value two, three years out looking? No, but they're going to underwrite something in their models that allows it to be more aggressive. And then the last thing that we'll touch on this in this section is kind of problems and addressing problems as early as possible. So, you know, one of the things that we like to tell our clients is, you know, on day one, let us know all the skeletons in the closet. Like, we're not going to judge you for what you did in the past, but we need to know what you've done and then create a plan as far as how to deliver the messaging that might be most appropriate. One of the worst things is to be surprised in a, in a process and have to tell your potential buyer that something came up that you were totally unaware of and that can have a significant impact on value, right? So one example of a deal that we worked on a number of years ago is during due diligence, probably a month before it closed, the seller found out that a lot of their product got stopped at the border and was counterfeit. We were like, oh my gosh, this was, we had no idea during the whole process. Luckily it was a, a small portion of the business, like uh, an accessory, but like that caused so much excess time and money put into the deal and working through escrows and this and that on the reps and warranties with the attorneys that it created a lot of noise. And if we would have kind of understood that ahead of time, we could have uh, appropriately um, talked about it with the buyer to make sure that they understood and kind of said, okay, this is our plan to correct it. So we were very fortunate that it didn't, um, you know, wreck the deal and we still got the deal done with that buyer, but that's one issue of a potential issue that we could have known ahead of time and it just popped up, you know, later on. You know. So, you know, kind of always think through those things. It may not be always that drastic, but that was kind of a, you know, a fairly drastic situation. Uh, but maybe it's more on environmental. You have like an oil spill or some underground tanks that hadn't been taken care of properly. Like disclosing those things to your advisors ahead of time is super important so that they can kind of help you craft the appropriate story. I think just avoid surprises for yourself if you're the business owner selling your business, right? It might be, it is what it is, type of risk exposure, whether it's $100,000 or a million dollars, but for you personally, that's the last thing you want to know after eight months of going through a process, a month before close, and say, oops, here's a surprise, that's a million dollars, it's kind of hard to swallow. But if you knew about it a year ahead of time and worked with people to identify certain things, whether it's sales and use tax exposure, whatever it might be, you know, eliminates that kind of surprise factor. All right, we have about five, <coughs> ten minutes here, so we'll kind of go through these next few slides a little bit quick, but certainly ask questions if you have it here. So, you know, if you're thinking about selling one year out, five years out, I'll try to pick a few off here that, you know, things that can be valuable to take into consideration. So we kind of talked about, you know, know where you make money and try to leverage that, pull that lever. You know, if there's spots you're not making money, let's maybe put quit putting resources towards that if possible, right? You gotta run your business. You know, timing a sale is difficult. Most businesses don't grow linearly. So you have some high growth years, you have some plateau years, you might have a dip year, but 
in a perfect world, you're going to the market, you're talking to buyers, and you're kind of on an upward trend. Um, you'll probably never time it perfect when you're at the peak, but it becomes really difficult to negotiate a top price when you start turning that corner because buyers will get a little bit scared, skeptical, and maybe they want to retrade or maybe they just want to slow down the whole process. Hey, let me see one more month worth of financials. So, you know, leaving some fruit on the tree, I think is a general saying people say, but that does, you know, it doesn't matter when you're going through a process. Uh, I call it a little bit of a buzzword. You know, buyers always want recurring, reoccurring revenue. I mean, it's not necessarily applicable to every business, but if there's ways to make your future business more predictable, more consistent, if you can put in certain contracts in place that, even if they're breakable, it kind of gives buyers comfort. Hey, at least they sign a five-year contract here that they want to work with you. Things of that nature really drive value. You know, customer base, end market exposure, concentrations. Um, it's kind of a double-edged sword depending on when you want to sell. You know, certainly if you have a high customer concentration, generally speaking, that maybe means more risk, which generally means a little bit less value. But when you're running your business, if that top customer is giving you a lot of business and hey, it's going to allow you to make money for the next one year, two years, three years, it allows you to reinvest in the business, I'd say you probably don't shy away from it. But just be conscious that you know it is creating additional risk for your business potentially. We talked about you know trying to build out that team. We talked about trying to reduce the dependence on the business owner. In personal matters, really, it's not just working with attorneys, but work with your accountant, your wealth manager, people of those natures, those expertise years ahead of time. Maybe there's certain estate planning steps you can take to reduce your tax exposure at close. So. It's never true really to kind of prep across the board. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Mary Scheidelin. I'm the CEO of Treeflow Group, and we're a marketing firm that does all B, we're really B2B, and we do primarily work with portfolio companies and with the PE firms that own those portfolio companies. So we're always putting these companies together, integrating them for the next sale off and out, you know, so whether but my question on the well-developed brand, reputation, and supporting culture, I don't know what you guys think, but it's my experience that that's not very well understood and that marketing isn't really a core competency of middle market companies, particularly in the manufacturing supply chain. And I, and I heard you talk before about articulate, being able to articulate your value proposition. You know, we're always talking about the importance of not just knowing your value proposition, but sharing it with the marketplace, can you make your marketing and your brand as cool as your shop floor? Because mm -hmm. when I look at manufacturers and you go out and you look at the sophistication of the technologies they're using there, mm -hmm. I mean, what if you created some of that creativity and that energy towards how you're actually positioning yourself in the marketplace and leveraging digital technologies, for example, to drive growth? So, I don't know, what do you guys think about that? Because it's like a new conversation almost as companies embrace what marketing looks like next, I guess I'll say. Yeah, I mean, I'll take the first day. I mean, I just, for whatever reason, my workflow in the last two years has worked a lot with metal contract manufacturing firms, sure, which I've almost do. Sure, I've worked with a lot of them too. No outbound marketing. Correct. But we are working with one now, and the individual sitting next to you um, is working on the deal as well. But. Um, it's an aerospace and defense type of marketing plan they really put in place two and a half years ago, and they really went all in on it. Like, probably invested almost 200 grand on rebranding the business, going to the right trade shows, producing industry trade newsletters. Just they want to be the known name. Yeah. And pretty quickly, it's you know it's a really great success success story because it doesn't happen overnight for a lot of firms. But they didn't tiptoe into it; they went all in. And, now they're getting website leads, they're going to trade shows, people are outreaching to them. Hey, I heard you're the guys with three week lead times, can we do more business with you? So it's not going to work for everyone, but there are success stories where I think it does drive a lot of value. And when we talk to buyers, they love the brand, they love what these guys are doing right. in the market. I, does, I think that's getting an above average multiple from my perspective. Because you want to fall in love with the company. Mm -hmm. What one of the panelists said in the last session was, was kind of love at first sight. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do that if you're not cool at all in how you're presenting yourself to the market? Yeah, and I'd say a, a lot of the lower middle market businesses that we represent probably have are underutilizing marketing, Correct. right? So 
from a private equity or a corporate standpoint, if you're looking at it from their perspective, they're probably thinking this is a great opportunity. I mean, we already have, you know, a CMO and, you know, a bunch of marketing people on staff that can really help kind of elevate this brand. Um, but also having a, a brand reputation that you've been a solid uh, company for a hundred years does, you know, do well in a lot of cases. But I think there are a lot of opportunities to kind of elevate that. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Confirmation. And you need, like you said, like 24 months or something out of wanting to sell your business. Mm -hmm. Then you can start to do it. You can't do this three months out from when you want to mm -hmm. sell. Mm -hmm. Right. Great question. Great answer. Great answer. Uh, legal matters, I think we hit on a lot of this. I would just say some of those handshake arrangements, I mean, we have countless examples. We go through a process and our clients say, trust me, it's a good relationship. They'll, we shared this product, it was kind of a joint venture. We've never really formalized it. They'll be fine once we go through a process. They'll sign the paperwork and inherently it's almost always a difficult matter. Um, it's never as smooth as they thought it would be. So all those handshake agreements, um, you can kind of formalize it ahead of a process. That's really good and it's not uncommon shifting gears a little bit, that some of your corporate records are probably a little bit out of date. Try to get those up to speed. You know, a lot of times the business owner owns the real estate, maybe there's no lease agreements in place, but just all that formalization just really drives value and this makes the whole process cleaner, makes it smoother, makes it more efficient, more efficient process, saves everyone time and money. Okay, and then what you can do between uh, kind of six to 12 months in advance, I'd probably give a plug for all my M&A attorneys in the audience because I think one of the best things that you could do in preparation for a sale is hiring an M&A specific attorney that can help kind of pull everything together for you ahead of time. Now we know a lot of companies don't do this and that's fine. We can help you along the way as you go. But I think, you know, if you're together a plan and you want to sell, kind of working with an attorney ahead of time to clean up your contractual uh, relationships, whether it be with customers or suppliers, making sure that you have all the signatures, <clears throat> that they're up to date, as I think was it Paul had mentioned, or one of the panelists had mentioned, just making sure that if you have a key can supplier, that you actually get that in writing. So things like that, I'd say organizing and updating your legal books, you know, the, those are kind of not, not very fun things to do, but necessary things for the deal. So those are types of things that you can do kind of six to 12 months out. The other big one that we touched on was kind of the networking capital component. The earlier you can start kind of analyzing your current assets and decreasing your current assets in a, uh, in a way that doesn't harm the business, and also increasing your current liabilities is going to lower your net worth and capital. So kind of looking at the financial metrics and you know how can you kind of extract some of the value before you go to market is always something that you want to look at. So those would be a few key things. I don't know, Mike, are we preventing people from getting drinks here? Well, I'd say, uh, <laughs> as expected, I didn't think we'd get to the market update, so this is probably a good pause. We can certainly go through some of this for folks that want to go through it quickly. I mean, a lot of it's going to be a continuation of maybe what you heard out there with some data behind it. But I'd say, more importantly, are there questions based on the topics we went through already? Let's address those first, and then I'll see where we're at. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious. I'm a wealth manager, so I have business owner clients that are working through what are we going to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious for a for a typical client that works with you guys, how, how many offers is a is, is it typical for a five six Mike, ten million dollars even in business? You want to go to that one slide? Oh, sure. yeah. yeah, just we, as an example. Like every answer, it depends. Right? Um, <laughs> if it's an attractive business, I mean, when we say offers, this this slide represents indications of interest, which are pretty representative of letters of intent on this deal as well. But I mean, on an attractive business, we're definitely probably getting 10 plus offers. On a really attractive business, we're probably getting 20 plus offers, at least indications of interest. 
we don't bring all those parties through for management presentations, continued discussions, etc. So, I mean, it's not uncommon where we get letters of intents between three and eight letters of intents on a deal. But you kind of got to go through this process, and you know, Corey mentioned a few examples when he gave our opening lines or Toro group, and this slide represents as well. I mean, everybody's looking at the same data, they're looking at the same company, they're reading the same SIM marketing materials, having the same conversations, but everybody values business different. So, unless you go through the process, you don't really know what the ultimate value is. And this is just one example where I think this deal closed a little over 50 million. We had that preemptive offer around 25 million. So, generally speaking, you have offers, offers, there's different economic terms, the parties are different. So, you know, you just kind of got to flush through what's the right option for that potential seller. And the caveat there, like the 10 to 20 offers is usually doing a broad auction. So we're going out to a couple hundred, maybe four to 500 potential buyers. So, you know, we are kind of canvassing the entire landscape to find confidentially who we think might be the best buyers. But yeah, Mike's, Mike's right, usually 10 to, to 20 is a good estimate. When you're taking an approach like that, where you're kind of blanketing the you know kind of marketing of the company, do you, do you use like I mean, like code names and stuff so you don't know yes. exactly what the company is? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the first thing that we send out is what we call a teaser. It's basically just a one pager. Has I don't even think it has a project name. It just kind of generalizes the company, and hopefully you can't even tell who the company is. Right. It's just like this is what they do, and then you sign the NDA, and then you get the material. Okay. Well, I think that's probably it. Yeah. We're at 505, so not that I wouldn't want to do it for the market update. Uh, we're talking about it after this. So the other thing it. is, uh, if you do want a copy of this presentation, get a hold of Mike or I. We have some business cards we can hand to you, or you can email us directly, and we'll just send you the, the PDF here. So that's uh, available to you as well. Yep. Thanks everyone for your time. Thank you.